Has the Relationship Alive podcast been helpful for you? If you like what we're doing and want to ensure that the podcast continues, you can help that happen for as little as the price of a monthly cup of coffee or a decent sandwich, or if it works for you, a lovely dinner. You can also make a one-time donation if that's better for you. For more information and to choose the tier that feels right, please visit neilsatin.com slash support. Or you can text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. Thank you so much for your help in making this podcast happen and being part of making the world's relationships more conscious and thriving as a whole. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. On today's show, I'm going to start with answering a listener question, and then we're going to cover a topic that has been requested by many, many listeners, perhaps even you, about the topic of long distance relationships. How do you make them work? How do you deal with the inevitable challenges of having relationships at a distance? And what are the recipes for really setting yourself up for success, as well as amplifying the things in long distance relationship that might actually be good and put you at an advantage over people who are doing, you know, relationships conventional style right next to each other. So uh, that's what today's show has in store for you. And I'm really excited. I've taken quite a while to think about the topic of long distance relationships and fit it in to this paradigm of how do you do conscious relationship well? How do you deal with being triggered? How do you deal with thriving in the things that where you really succeed in relationship? And I wanted to give it some thought so that when it finally came time for today, for this episode, I'd have some coherent thoughts for you. So I'm going to speak from the heart and the soul and the mind and the body as we dive into long distance relationships. But first, the listener question. And this question is relevant to the topic of long distance relationships in some way because it relates to the episode that I did a few episodes ago, number 85, on how and why to take space. And so I had a listener write, and I'm not, I don't have the question right here in front of me, but it was something along the lines of, okay, this is, this is great what you have to say about taking space and all, but what if my partner wants to go away for like two weeks? How do I avoid taking that personally? Because that seems like a long amount of time to want to be away. So it's a great question and it can, I can imagine, I don't know exactly what your circumstance is, um, but I know in my life things are really busy and there's a lot going on. So taking two weeks away, either if I did that or if Chloe did that, that would represent a huge change in how we even manage our lives and how we manage the kiddos and the day to day and, and so there's that question of um, this is somewhat dependent on the circumstance of your life and how much you and your partner are managing together. That being said, let's just look at it for face value. There's, I was, I was thinking it f- about that question from two perspectives. One is, okay, let's say I'm the one who wants to take two weeks to myself. And I could imagine, honestly, all kinds of reasons why that would be amazing. I could see just wanting to take a breather and get some perspective on life. I could see maybe there's some project that I really want to focus time and energy on. Or maybe there are friends in another city that I want to visit. Or or maybe I have this real desire to just kind of feel feel into who I am on my own. I want to travel or, or do something that's just for me and that's about getting in touch with 
with who I who I am and who I am without uh, who I am as a partner and who I am as a father and etc or who you are as a mother let's say so so I could think of all these great reasons why like hey two weeks that sounds like that sounds like a great amount of time and I could see at the end of that probably really wanting to be back and really wanting to be in it with my family and my beloved and um, and being all the more rich for having had that experience of that time by myself. So that being said, it brings up the question of what is it about the two weeks that feels so personal to you? Because taking that kind of time apart I could also see that being really triggering. Well, why why does this person want to take time apart? Or if the container of your relationship has some has some holes in it, you know, if it's a, a leaky vessel, then I could see that being especially triggering. If you're not sure, like, does does my partner really want to be with me? Or is this one of those like midlife crisis moments where they want to just go to Vegas and live it up for two weeks and whatever happens there stays there? Um, is this one of those moments? I'm So I wonder for you, um, what is the state of the container of your relationship? And what is it about the taking two weeks of space? What kind of fears for you come up in that? Because this creates a perfect opportunity for you with your partner to address those fears and to do it in a way that hopefully brings safety and stability to your relationship with your partner, where two weeks away or even if it had to happen two months away could could actually work um, if it were truly required. So... Whenever we're taking something personally, even if it seems that the other person is making it personal, like I just need two weeks away from you so I can find myself. Well, that does feel personal on some level. But if we can step back from the surface of taking it personally and try to get to the core of what that brings up in us for our fears and also see if we can get to the core of what might be motivating our partner's desire for that level of space um, and see if we can if we can get to the truth with compassion again not making it about us but just trying to really see in and feel in to what is happening with your partner then you're going to be able to communicate it about you're going to be able to communicate about it in a way that I think will lead you to more connection. And of course, if you haven't gotten it yet, you should get my communication guide, which gives you some really important tips on how to have those kind of conversations in a way that will bring you together. And just as a reminder, the link for that is neilsatin.com slash slash relate. Uh, just one slash in there, or you can text the word relate to the number 33444 and follow the instructions and you'll get the communication guide. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful for you. I don't think that objectively your partner wanting to have two weeks to themselves is cause for concern. However, it's clearly creating concern in you. So I would shoot for the, the level beneath the concern and see if you can get at more of the truth of what's happening, what's happening within you, what's happening within your partner, and find a way to come together and communicate it, communicate about it uh, so that you find more safety and stability. And that will probably require you getting even more clear about your agreements with each other which is part of the container. And then the other side of the container is your exits and making sure that either you or your partner have uh, closed those doors that might be leading you outside of the relationship. And that's the key really to creating safety in the container of your relationship. Now you can probably see why this question is relevant to the bigger topic of long distance relationships, which is what we're talking about today. Now, just to define 
long distance relationships, let's just say that this is a relationship where you are separate from your beloved for lengths of time. And that could be that, you know, as, as short as a week, you know, maybe you're only together on the weekends, but you have to spend the weeks apart. Um, maybe you have to be apart for longer periods of time. Maybe you actually live in separate cities and you're navigating what that's about it for you to each have a home where you are and to have where you are be two totally different places. So it's this question of what do you do when proximity isn't something you can take for granted? That's one. And then, and what does that do to the structure of your togetherness when you're actually together? So there's the, the, the time apart and how you structure that. And then there's also the time together and the way that long distance relationships can often create this crazy intensity. And it doesn't have to be crazy, but it, it can certainly be intense. Those moments when you come together and there's all the love and the longing and the missing that is there in those moments. There's also maybe the unspoken or unfinished business, the things that you can't really address in your in the distance that you experience um, that can only be really handled in the together times. And if you're apart a lot, you may have a lot of those things where you're really um, needing to talk about the business of your relationship, talk about things that are troubling you. Um, and so that kind of intensity can also be really present for you. So it's kind of the advantage of the day in, day out kind of relationship is that um, you have the ability to, to ride those waves a lot more smoothly. Um, but on the flip side, they do say absence makes the heart grow fonder. And under circumstances, under certain circumstances, I think that's true. It's not always true. But having that space built into your relationship can give you uh, important time to nurture yourself and to energize yourself and to focus on the things that are important to you. Um, and then hopefully you have that much more energy to give to the times that you're together, which is probably part of what's fueling that intensity. So let's think about the different aspects of relationship and how they're challenged by long distance relationships and, and how, they're benef how, th how they can be benefited by a long distance relationship if that's indeed the case. I was already talking a bit about the container. And for me, when I think about a long distance relationship, that's the very first thing that pops into my head. It's how well do you as a couple, how well have you made your uh, agreements explicit so that you know what to expect with each other? Um, so that could be what you're shooting for and your vision. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Or it could be the things that also create safety around, say, not dating other people when you're apart. Now, if you're inclined to polyamory, maybe that doesn't matter to you. Maybe you're like, hey, when you're in your world, you do what you want. And then when we come together, I want your exclusive focus and attention. So I'm not ruling out that possibility. But what's clear is that you need to be really clear about what it is that you're doing with your partner. So identify what is strong about your container. Where, where do you know that you are in perfect alignment with your partner? And then identify the ways in which you're maybe feeling a little less secure about that alignment with your partner and, and address it, find ways to address it. And again, the way to address it is through communication. So you're going to have to, in one way or another, find ways to communicate with your partner about the challenges of long distance and about your container. Now, I mentioned also in the container this question of um, your vision. And this is important, I think, because my, my impression, now I've done long distance relationship in the past. Thankfully for me, it's in the past. Um, and one thing that I know is almost entirely true, 
is that it can create a lot of stress. And so for me, um, I would be wondering like, okay, how long am I doing this for? Now for you, you might be perfectly happy with the structure of long distance relationships. So if time apart and time together, if that more or less works for you, then okay, this isn't an issue for you. But I would start thinking about what is your vision for relationship together? It's one thing to find amazing connection and love and for that to be with someone who happens to need to be away a lot of the time. But um, it's totally another thing to think about, well, where is this going? Where do we want this to go? What is the vision we have for our relationship together? And does that vision include us always being apart? Or do we share a vision for this time of apartness uh, being only temporary? Or is that something that only one of us is holding? Or do we potentially have some deal breakers where we both share a vision of wanting to be together, but you don't want to leave where you are and I don't want to leave where I am? So how do you navigate with each that with each other? You're going to have to communicate about it. And it seems like if you ultimately both want to be together in the same place, then you're going to have to get creative for how to do that if you are rooted, if you're each rooted in where you are. So some of that may be relaxing a little bit, your notion about what what your life is supposed to look like. You know, maybe you spend half the year in one place and half the year in the other place, or there are lots of options here, so I'm not going to spell them all out for you. But the question is, can you get creative? And prior to that, can you be really clear with each other about what you want? And can you overcome your fear of what you want not being what your partner wants? So even in this situation that I'm, this hypothetical situation that I'm describing, uh, where both people are rooted in, in separate places, um, there's the risk that in saying, you know, I really, I love you. I want to be with you. I want to be together with you. I don't, I don't like the way that this um, distance pulls us apart over and over again. Um, and the only way I, and, and I don't see moving. So the only way I can see that happening is if you were to move, let's say that's what you, let's say that's what you said. Are you willing to speak that desire and at the one, on the one hand, stay flexible? Because even though that's what you want, it may in the end be that what you can accept and live with and what actually feels really great to you isn't exactly that. At the same time, you also have to face your fear that in the end, what you want isn't what your partner wants. And there are some decisions that you might have to make under those circumstances that are going to require you to be gentle with each other and compassionate. And to getting back to the, uh, the earlier question I was dealing with, to um, not take things personally. Um, because it may not be personal. It may be that um, that there's so much that's that is uh, anchoring either one of you in the current circumstance that that uh, there's no changing it, at least not right now. So you might agree that, all right, well, we're going to be in this holding pattern and hold the possibility that something could change at some point. Because sometimes that's all it takes, you know, is saying, is honoring like, okay, right now everything seems fixed. There's nothing we can do. And yet I know in the world that everything changes. Everything is always changing. So if I'm open to the possibility of how this might change or how my idea about this might change, then you may find yourself noticing other possibilities that you hadn't, hadn't even noticed before. Um, because sometimes those things aren't available to you, not only um, because you're not being open to that possibility, but also because you haven't fully accepted what is. So if you have all of this energy going into 
um, resisting the way things are right now, then that can make it really challenging to see what the next right step is. Because what you want is such a such a big leap from what exists right now that the path for that leap may either not seem obvious or may seem like such a huge risk that it really triggers your safety issues. And, and then you have that to deal with on top of all the relationship stuff. Okay, so that's your vision. Now, let's talk about the nitty gritty of how to handle the intensity of time together along with the spaciousness of time apart. Now, I did mention the uh, some of the concerns around how to take space and why and how to do that in the episode 85. So I'm going to spend probably less time on taking space and at least in this moment say that um, the important things about the space are first to think about how that can be an advantage for you, again, to devote energy to things that are you. Also, I think to create rituals and touchstones with your partner, assuming that works for both of you, so that you can stay connected during that time. So unless for some reason you can't be in contact, I recommend finding ways to just check in with each other using text or to FaceTime or Skype or Zoom or whatever with each other so you can actually see each other face to face. And to do that in a regular way so that you can start building some of the the ritual and routine into your relationship that you would normally have if you live together. So as much as it's practical, you might try to do something like we've talked about on the show, the, the bedtime gratitude ritual where you share three appreciations with each other. Um, maybe you make a commitment to do that together every night before you go to sleep. Um, it, as long as it's possible. You could also think about structuring your life in a way that it is still honoring your relationship, um, even though you're not there with each other. So as an example, instead of, say, going out every night and hanging out with your friends on the nights that you're alone, you might carve out time that's either about being alone and facing what that's all about, or um, you could carve out time and have it be time that you are focused on your relationship. So that could be something like reading a relationship book. It could be listening to this podcast. It could be writing in a journal about your relationship. It could be taking time together. So if you would normally have that time after, you know, the kids are asleep or after dinner every night where you would share that with each other, why not build that into your life even though you're apart? You know, technology makes that so easy now for us to be in each other's lives. Um, So I recommend working that in if it's possible for you, being in each other's lives. And hopefully what that does is it also helps regulate that intensity of the times that you come together. Because practically speaking, it's really challenging to ex- to have the important exchanges that you need to have, either if it's like, you know, the exchange of bodily fluids or the... Um, all right, I'm not going to be as so crass. If if it's coming together to make love with each other or um, coming together to have a challenging conversation, that's really hard to do at a distance. So as much as you can stay connected with each other and in the groove with each other um, around and, and be in the container of your relationship, even when you're apart, and maybe even tuning in to, um, Chloe and I call it the continuum, but tuning into the sensual energy that you experience in, as a human in the world and, and focusing that on thoughts of your partner, 
I mean, that could be masturbation, but it could also be simply thinking about your partner and seeing how that feels in your body and noticing where you feel it and what that's like. And again, this is a way of bringing conscious attention to your partnership. And you may need to schedule it on your calendar because especially if your partner is not there, um, just to create a structure for yourself to do that might be helpful for you to really just schedule it in like tonight from, you know, eight to nine, it's relationship time. Okay, so that's some thoughts on your time apart. Now let's talk about the time together. My hope for you is that you are finding ways to be more balanced. And, um, you know, it's just, it's funny, it's occurring to me right now that the way that we live in today's world, it can feel like you're in a long distance relationship, even if you are with your partner day in, day out, because the way life is with work and all the things that, that are required of us, um, sometimes we're not even really connecting on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. So I just, I've just felt moved to, to share that, that there's a lot in here around, of course, how you structure the day-to-day -day life, your day-to-day -day life in relationship when you're together. That's also really important um, because, you know, taking it for granted is a sure recipe for, um, well, if not boredom, um, some sort of entropy that where you're not really feeling that kind of connection and juice and spark that I want you to feel as regularly as possible. All right. Now for the time together. So few things. One is I'm going to spend very little time on the like amazing sex that you're hopefully having every time you come back together and those moments of reunion and and, you know, longing, satisfied, and all of that. Except to say that I encourage you to not be like this, um, this flash in the pan when it comes to your um, sexual and sensual connection, that you see that as a fire that you're tending. And if you have like wild, crazy, amazing sex, well, that can be great. And as we've talked about on the show, um, that could potentially also contribute to feelings of dissatisfaction and the, the things that can possibly happen, especially after you're having like big O1 peak orgasms with your partner. So if you're not sure what I'm talking about, you're going to maybe want to go back and listen to episode two with Diana Richardson, which is about the power of slow sex, or episode five with Marnia Robinson, which is about how orgasms are hurting your relationship. So I recommend you check those out because it'll give you some context for what I'm talking about. But what I'm saying is that the more that your lovemaking can be nurturing and long and drawn out and maybe even woven into the fabric of the time that you have together, um, where you ease in and ease out of that sensual and sexual and spiritual sacred connection with each other, then the more that connection will support everything else that's happening. Um, whereas the potential exists that you have that kind of surge of dopamine from coming back together and then you have even more dopamine from, let's say, coming together and then, um, and then you could have a huge crash and be irritable. And if you only have a few days together, let's say, then that irritability over day two, day three can really take its toll, even though... It was so amazing to have the, the huge highs of day one when you finally came together. Now, I'm not assuming that every time you um, reunite that it's fireworks and crazy amazingness. Like, if you're, if you're lucky enough that that's the case, then that's great. But I imagine that sometimes when you come together, you're coming together also with a sense of uneasiness. And maybe there are things that have occurred during your time apart that have created uh, breaches in the safety or mistrust or just loneliness or just where you feel like you're, you're, you haven't 
your partner isn't showing up for you or you realize you haven't been fully showing up for your partner. Part of the art of long distance relationship is figuring out how do you still show up for each other even when you're apart? And that was part of what I was suggesting with the, uh, the rituals when we were talking about time apart just a few moments ago. So now you're in the same space and let's say that there's some challenges that need to be worked through. One of the obvious problems with the long distance relationship in the time that you come together is that it can feel like so much is riding on those moments of togetherness. And especially if you're feeling polarized in your relationship, like that it's kind of not happening or only kind of happening when you're apart and then it's full on when you're together. Um, So that's another reason for building that balance into the structure and really honoring your relationship time when you're apart. Because hopefully you can step back from the intensity, at least to realize that it doesn't have to all be about this moment. If you're in relationship for the long haul, then while each moment is important in the present, hopefully you have lots of moments that are going out into the infinite future. And so this moment is just one of those moments. And my wish for you is that that can at least slightly diminish the charge and the importance of this particular thing that we're experiencing so that you can step back and use the skills that we've talked about here on the podcast over and over again around coming back from from being triggered. So if you come together and you're feeling that uneasiness, almost undoubtedly you are feeling triggered in that moment. So how do you come together with your partner and say, oh my God, it's so great to see you and I'm already triggered. And you know, can we breathe together? Can we, can we just be together? Um, or I'm, it's so great that you're here and like just seeing you, I'm, I'm realizing I need like, now that I've seen you, I need like five minutes to just like bring myself back into balance. And then, you know, then we can leave the airport and, and do whatever, you know, whatever it is that we're doing. So, um, so recognizing the very same things, are you triggered? Can you handle that? together so that you both come back into balance, back into regulation, so that you can be fully present with each other? Can you bring attention to the intensity that you're feeling by speaking to what you're feeling in your body? So it can be really tempting to feel all of this energy inside and feel like, ah, it all needs to be expressed. And and you might express it attaching it to some problem that's been bothering you or plaguing you about your partner. And it could be that those things actually aren't even connected. It could be that you're just really excited to see your your beloved right there in the flesh. And yet you're also kind of pissed at them about something. And you might not want those things to coincide with each other. You might want to separate them and be willing to savor the excitement of seeing your partner for what it is and all that energy that comes up and recognize that all of that charge and energy may not actually be helpful if you are connecting it to whatever challenges you're experiencing with your partner. Then what I suggest you do is that you find time if there are things that are going on and even if there aren't or even if you think there aren't because there might be things going on that your partner hasn't let on about. I think it's helpful in your time together to carve out, to schedule a time and maybe it'll just need to be half an hour or maybe you put three hours on on your calendar together or your itinerary for the time that you have together and you say, okay, this is the time that we're going to talk about what's going well. And this is the time that we're also going to talk about what's been challenging for us. So setting the scheduled time is important because otherwise you might feel like 
if you haven't addressed whatever needs to be addressed yet, then that thing could be there permeating all of your interactions with your partner and making it really challenging to just be there in the moment. Um, or on the flip side, it could be that you feel the sense of overwhelm. Like if I bring this topic up, well, it's just going to ruin everything because all we have is this time together and I don't want it to ruin everything. So you might not bring it up or you might save it to the last minute. That's a sure recipe for disaster, right? It's like you're getting ready to say goodbye and then it's like, oh, by the way, there's this burning thing that I've been needing to tell you. Um and I just didn't want to ruin our time together. Well, now I'm going to ruin our time, our departure time. So hopefully, hopefully, I'm saying hopefully a lot. And I guess that's because there's a lot of hope. I have hope for you in long distance relating that you can find balance that feels really good. And the more that I've thought about long distance relationship, the more hope I have for people in those situations. So if you're in that situation, that you can strike a balance that actually does work for you. And on some level, I, I recognize that it's challenging. So I'm, I'm also giving you an infusion of my optimism. And as you can probably tell, I have a lot of it almost all the time. And I want you to feel that so that you know that there is hope for you if you're feeling like there isn't or if you're feeling like the challenges have been insurmountable or if you're not sure where you're heading with it. Okay, so by carving out the time, you're also putting a limit on how much pain you are going to experience. Now that may not be true. You may not be able to totally time box the painful part of your conversation, but what you can do is you can at least say, okay, we're going to have this conversation. It's going until this time. And then we are going to regroup. We're going to come back together. We're going to realize that we love each other. We're going to do something special. We're going to take a walk. We're going to get out of this, um, this intense moment and honor that we are in this process together. That, and maybe we need to set another time to talk about it later tonight or tomorrow, but it's on the table and yet it doesn't have to tarnish all of our time together. We can, and if you, if you need to, you might at, at that point, if you really think it will, maybe you schedule like, okay, let's schedule time to give each other a massage or let's time, let's schedule time to watch a comedy together or, um, or let's just honor, let's schedule time to just be with each other and just honor that it's challenging and whatever comes up in that. And, um, and to honor the love and compassion that comes up in that. Again, always remembering, like, am I taking this personally and can I not take it personally? Can I, can I look at my partner with compassion? Can I look at myself with compassion? So, what I want for you is in that time together to strategize ways that can diminish the intensity so that the intensity doesn't get in the way of your just being and experiencing each other. The big picture of what we're looking at is for your time apart to feel more connected and supportive of your relationship so that in your time together, there's a little less intensity, you're already feeling the connection. And to the extent that you've been able to stay in connection and process with each other, there aren't these big things that you now need to address with each other. That ideally is part of the process all along. And it's done through face-to-face -face as much as possible. So that's why I suggest FaceTime or Skype or something like that. Um, because texting is, there's so much room. Texting and emailing and even a phone call, there's so much room for misinterpretation of what you're getting from the other person that um, as much as possible, anything that requires you to actually truly be present for each other and really understand each other and work through something, you should be able to see your partner's face and be able to make eye contact and and to give your full presence that way to your partner um, you'll have 
so much more connection and chance of actually successfully navigating the challenges when you're apart, as well as the intensity of your reunions. So all in all, the question is, how do you create a structure that supports you and your partner in your connection when you have to spend time apart? You do it through finding ways to stay present for yourself and with each other. You do it by ensuring that you have as much as possible open lines of communication with each other. You do it through bringing attention to the container of your relationship, your agreements, your vision, as well as closing your exits and dedicating time to your relationship even when you're apart as well as when you're together. You do it by staying curious about each other and and what better things to provide topics for conversation than to talk about what's been happening in the times that you're not together or to talk about what it's like to not be together and how to navigate that together. There are all sorts of ways that you can be curious with each other. You do it by paying attention to your sensual and sexual being and your spiritual connection to your partner and nurturing it even in the times that you're apart through giving it attention and through giving yourself attention, but in connection with your partner, not in isolation. And then you're in the work of relationship in general. How do you overcome your triggers together? How do you uh, create community that supports who you are in the world together? How do you contribute to the world together? Um, and how do you create a sexual connection with your partner that helps you keep the fire alive instead of potentially creating disconnection and irritability. Um, you want to keep the fire burning and not let it burn out. And overall, how can you be tuned in to the big waves of time together and time apart and not get polarized and as much as possible find ways to bring balance to each of those times? And it may not be... 100% possible, but that's okay. You know, as long as you're bringing conscious awareness to it and seeing how that shifts the way that you interact with each other, then you're going to make progress and you'll feel more connection and a little less intensity in a good way and be able to make progress around the things that are challenges in your relationship because we all have challenges in our relationships. So my goal for you is to at least sidestep the intensity enough to do the real work where you're not triggered by the intensity. And again, yes, I recommend separating the energy of reconnecting or the energy of being apart. You know, that's messing with our attachment circuitry all the time. Um, to, to disconnect that energy from the the energy of the problems that you might be experiencing and just rest in that question like what if this problem isn't as serious as all this energy would have me believe what if they're not connected can i separate them in a way that helps me use this energy in a way that feels really good in our connection and that also helps me help support us in navigating whatever challenges we have in a way that uh, that connects us and doesn't necessarily have to carry all of that charge I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, this episode has been a long time coming, and I'm really excited that it's finally come together. Again, I could write a whole book, uh, but there are at least another couple books that have to happen first before the long-distance relationship one happens. If you are in a long-distance relationship and I missed something important, then let me know and I'll cover it on another episode of Relationship Alive. You can reach me at neilius, N-E-I-L-I-U-S, at neilsatin.com, or you can find me in the Relationship Alive community on Facebook. And if you know someone who's in a long-distance relationship, then consider sending this episode their way. The link to it is going to be very easy, neilsatin.com slash longdistance. 
all one word. So you can send them that link. Finally, I just wanted to let you know that next week we are going to have a return visit from Haiti Schleifer. She was with us back in in episode 69 to talk about how to be completely alive in your relationship. And in particular, her work has taken the Imago dialogue work of Harville Hendricks and Helen LaCalle Hunt even further into what she calls encounter-centered therapy. So that's what we talked about in episode 69. In this coming episode, we're going to talk about how to unravel the survival knot, which she sees as like the this is the problem that you and your partner come together to resolve. And generally, when you come together with your partner, it gets really tangled in this one particular place. So so she is coming on the show to talk about how to unravel the most sticky situation possible. So I look forward to seeing you next week. As always, let me know how how you're doing and if the show has had an impact on you. And one last reminder, if you like what we're doing, if Relationship Alive has been helpful for you, please consider a monthly contribution or a one-time donation for as little as the price of a cup of coffee every month. You can make a huge difference in ensuring that the Relationship Alive podcast continues. To do that, you just visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444. Thank you so much and take care.